give an update about the search. Uh, I can't say much other than that the uh, um, search committee made a recommendation to the faculty, uh, to the IB faculty yesterday, uh, and then votes from IB faculty happen electronically over the next week, uh, and until uh, that voting is, is done, uh, we, I'm, we, we can't say anything about the outcome of the search. I know everybody's very curious. Uh, but we'll make that all public just as soon as we can, and that'll, that'll be next week some, sometime. Okay, uh, I will uh, uh, introduce Mike Boots uh, to introduce uh, today's seminar speaker. So, Mike is a professor at IB that everybody uh, knows, I assume. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. <laughs> no, it's, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Kara to this community. So Kara is from Northern California, went to Stanford, as an undergraduate. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> and then went to Princeton um, to EB to the um, disease group there, um, advised by uh, Andy Dobson and Jess Andy, just Andy. Advised by Andy Dobson. And there she developed this field system completely on her own. This is entirely uh, from scratch during her PhD. I think you can see now what. What Kara does is she works on these bats, and she works on viruses in bats. There's probably going to be a pandemic virus that, that comes out at some point that's going to have a huge impact on us all, and it's probably going to come from bats. So this is an important, <laughs> really important thing to do. Bats are kind of interesting and a bit weird when it comes to viruses, and this is kind of one of the things Kara's working on. And what, what uniquely she does is that she is also looking at within host mechanisms of the virus and is a big field work component of looking what's happening in the field, what's happening phenotypically and also using modeling to try and understand um, this interaction between these viruses in bats, what makes bats special and interesting, why they have all these viruses, why these viruses might be the biggest zoonosis risk and understanding that um, holistically through all these different approaches. She's a Miller Fellow, she's um, hosted here in, in my group upstairs, but also with Britt Glausinger, if you don't know, is a virologist in PMB and an HHMI uh, professor who's really proper virologist working on cell cultures and cell lines. So uh, uniquely, I think Cara manages to do that kind of work, really proper molecular virology work, right through to epidemiological modeling and through a, a huge field component as well. So she's going to tell you about this work. Um, so, I'm Kara. Thanks so much for the invitation to talk. Um, I'm going to be talking today about between and within host mechanisms of viral hosting in bat reservoirs for emerging infectious disease. So, bats have received increasing attention in recent years for their role as reservoir hosts for a number of highly virulent emerging human infections, including rabies and related lysoviruses, Hendra and Nipah Hennepa viruses, SARS and potentially MERS coronaviruses, and Ebola and Marburg filoviruses. Bats are no known to host more zoonotic viruses, so viruses that transmit from wildlife to people per capita than any other mammalian order, including rodents, but they appear not to experience morbidity or mortality from these viruses that cause <coughs> extreme mortality in other mammals. And this has led researchers to ask, are bats somehow special in their capacity as pathogen hosts? And as Mike presented, I approach this question from a number of different angles that I'm going to be discussing in today's talk, chiefly focusing on sort of a literature review, then looking at the population level where I run this field site in Madagascar, and also um, touching on some of the within-host viral hosting mechanisms. So the literature tells us that bats are unique in many ways physiologically. They're the only volant mammal, so the only truly flying mammal. And despite achieving metabolic <laughs> rates in flight that are some nine times that of a rodent at full speed running, they're the longest lived per body size of any mammalian taxon. So here um, we plot log of adult biomass on the x-axis, log of maximum lifespan on the y-axis. All mammals are in black, primates are in red, and bats are in blue. So the longest lived bat lives up to 40 years in the wild. They undergo daily torpor and sometimes annual hibernation, so a shutdown of metabolic functioning that is linked to their longevity. And at least anecdotally, they appear to be resistant or possibly resilient to a number of cancers. 
it's been suggested that all of these physiological mechanisms might be linked to the evolution of flight. And research is accumulating to suggest that intracellular oxidative damage and repair pathways in bats are in some ways special. So there was a paper from Lin Fa Wong, uh, a collaborator of mine at Duke National University of Singapore. His group published in 2013 in Science, showing that both insectivorous and frugivorous bat genomes are under positive selection in the DNA damage and repair pathway. They've lost the PYHIN gene family, which um, is involved in, in damage sensing, and also lost some receptors for natural killer cells and antiviral defenses. Then by contrast to these sort of down-regulated uh, mechanisms of pathogen awareness, this group subsequently showed that at least two different frugivorous bat species have constitutively expressed interferon alpha, which is an antiviral cytokine, across multiple tissue types, suggesting that they have this perpetually primed antiviral immune system. And just a couple of weeks ago, they had a paper come out showing that, again, in contrast in this sort of yin and yang, uh, approach to uh, damage control and awareness that they have a dampened sting pathway. So sting is the interferon-inducing pathway by which cell recognizes double-stranded DNA in the cytoplasm and uh, basically goes into um, a damage control uh, signaling cascade upon metabolic or viral-induced stress. So um, cells have some mechanisms that are upregulated and some that are downregulated all suggesting that they have this constitutively, perpetually primed immune system, but that they're able to um, avoid immunopathology induced by sort of a, a, a rapidly uh, occurring induced immune response. And so since a number of these pathways are, or all of these pathways are linked to within uh, intracellular mechanisms of metabolic control, we might predict that bats' specialness would be limited to intracellular infections that share that same pathway. And at least anecdotally, we can say that bats appear to be susceptible to pathology incurred by extracellular infections. So you've probably all heard of white nose syndrome caused by the fungal infection, Pseudogenococcus destructans, and it's decimated bat populations across North America in the past decade. And essentially, this is an immunopathologic response to a fungus growing on the wing, uh, which causes high mortality in bat populations. But even for intracellular infections, such as viruses, bats appear to trade off their control strategies seasonally, suggesting that there is some cost to these infections and they are mediating resource use accordingly. So it's been demonstrated in the literature that um, antibody titers, so the humoral immune response, is elevated during periods of pregnancy and lactation in female <coughs> bats. So I showed two plots here on the left. Um, this is seroprevalence to Hendra virus in Australian flying foxes. We see it's very high in pregnant and lactating females, and much lower in males and non-reproductive females. And then on the right, these are individually resampled captive uh, Yadol and Helvum bats in Ghana. And this is serotiter, so antibody response to uh, Nipah virus in this system, or to some related Hennepah virus. And we see that individual females actually elevate their antibody response during reproductive periods, and then it declines during the rest of the year. It might seem counterintuitive to show this higher immune response during periods of reproductive uh, uh, stress, but we also know that these same um, reproductive periods are also linked to uh, higher rates of viral shedding, so actual live virus recovered by a PCR in bat urine or feces. Um, so I should say that most bat populations, and specifically frugivorous bat populations, give birth in synchronous annual pulses, so there is a breeding season. And, and it seems that these higher periods of uh, antibody response are linked to viral pulses, which are subsequently linked to spillover of these pathogens to other organisms, including humans. <coughs> and so this suggests that antibodies might offer a metabolically cheaper means of pathogen control, but that it might be less effective and thereby allow these shedding events to occur. But I should point out that the time lag between shedding and seropositivity hasn't been very well elucidated because most of these studies have been separate. They've either been serological or they've been PCR in nature uh, and not linked. But we can hypothesize that bats might be trading off immune investment um, from a more metabolically costly mechanism of pathogen control, such as an innate pathway like this constitutive interferon, uh, and then moving into antibody-mediated immunity for viral control during these uh, reproductively stressed periods.
and so we'll return to that at the end of the talk. So we see the same evidence of these seasonal trends in our Madagascar system. Um, so this is work in collaboration with James Wood and Andrew Cunningham at the University of Cambridge and Zoological Society of London with Jessica Metcalf at Princeton uh, and my close colleagues at Institut Pasteur de Madagascar, the Chief of Virology, Jean-Michel Epreau, and my close Malagasy colleague, uh, Dr. Hafaliana Christian Ranebusi. So why Madagascar, you might ask. We heard about this last week, but Madagascar <laughs> is an island off the southeastern uh, coast of Mozambique. Um, it's a closed system, so it's home to three endemic fruit bats found nowhere else on Earth, Yadalan helvum, Tropus rufus, and Rosettus madagascariensis. I focus on the frugivorous species because they're large and they're consumed widely across the island for food. So this is a menu. Fanihi is the Malagasy word for fruit bat, so 2,000 ariari. Um, and the origins of these three species are phylogenetically quite interesting. So this is a map from WHO showing the distribution of Hennepa virus, so Hendra and Nipah related viral outbreaks, these little stars in blue um, across Asia. And the purple line gives the distribution of the <coughs> old world fruit bat clade. So bats are divided into two suborders, Yangterochiroptera and Yangterochiroptera. And old world fruit bats are limited to uh, uh, Africa, Asia, and Australia. And specifically, the Tropus genus of these bats is highlighted in green. And that's been linked uh, disproportionately to Hennepovirus outbreaks. So Madagascar represents um, the westernmost range of the Tropus clade. But filoviruses, um, Ebola and Marburg, have been restricted mostly to Africa. Um, and so Madagascar is one of the few places on Earth where we have coexistence of both the Eidolon clade, so Eidolon helvum is distributed across the African continent, and its sister species, Eidolon duprianum, is present in Madagascar. Uh, and then we have coexistence of Eidolon with Tropus, in addition to a Rosetta species. And Rosetta is kind of pan Indian Ocean in distribution and its sister species, Rosettus aegypticus, is the known reservoir for Marburg virus in, uh, chiefly in Uganda. So sort of all, uh, all viral clades and their bats represented. So during my dissertation work, uh, we captured and serum sampled 810 Madagascar fruit bats um, across 19 months of the year, um, so a longitudinal study. We collected serum that underwent Luminex-based Bioplex assay at the Institute of Zoology, and that was to test for Hendra, Nipah, and Cedar Hennepa virus antibodies, and also <coughs> Ebola and Marburg Philo virus antibodies. So there are no, um, no known uh, negative samples um, from this data set because these assays were not originally developed for Malagasy bats or their viruses. We're still working to get viral sequences off of our findings, and none of these animals have previously been um, raised in captivity. And so to determine what constitutes a seropositive uh, animal, we use a technique known as mixture modeling. So essentially, a Luminex assay returns a measure of uh, binding. So you present a known antigen, so Ebola virus uh, Zaire antigen, for example, to a serum sample and see how well that serum binds to that known antigen. Um, so we would assume that seronegative individuals would have some binding distribution that would be low, whereas seropositive individuals would have some higher level of binding distribution. So um, a Luminex assay returns a measure of MFI, mean fluorescence intensity, and we can fit normal distributions uh, to, the, to the MFI data. And so we actually fit three distributions um, to encompass a seronegative and a seropositive distribution, and then a middle, more inconclusive distribution just to be um, more conservative because it essentially forces the seronegative and seropositive distributions apart. And then we establish the MFI cutoff at three standard deviations above the mean of the inconclusive distribution. Um, I did some bootstrapping analysis to then um, uh, make confidence intervals around that cutoff and establish both a lower confidence, more lenient threshold, and a higher conf uh, confidence, uh, stricter threshold. And redid all analyses based on those three different cutoffs for seropositivity. So I'm going to present just the mean results today, but um, data are essentially recapitulated across these three different cutoffs. We then use selection criteria to limit analyses to species antigen combinations that possess true seropositives. So remember, we were testing uh, five different antigens, Hendra, Nipah, and Cedar, um, and uh, Ebola and Marburg, against three different species. We came up with seropositives um, for a subset of those antigen species combinations. So we have seropositive 
uh, individuals in Yadawan Duprianum and Rosetta's Madagascariensis for Cedar virus. We have Ebola seropositive Teropus rufus and Rosetta's <coughs> Madagascariensis, and then Hendra seropositive Teropus rufus and Rosetta's, and Nipah seropositive Yadawan Duprianum. We do get binding to the Hendra and Nipah antigen across all three species, but it binds better um, with the Nipah antigen in the case of Yadawan and the Hendra antigen in the case of Teropus and rufus. And phylogenetically, this makes sense. Um, I told you that the Teropus bat uh, genus is, is Asian in its distribution, and Hendra virus comes from Australia. Um, so this is closer to Australia. Um, the Nipah virus tends to be Asian um, and potentially also African. Um, so phylogenetically, we're seeing patterns that, that do make sense. Um, these data suggest that we likely have multiple filoviruses and multiple henofaviruses circulating in our system. The Ebola binding is different across the two different species. Um, but there's a number of potential immune mechanisms that could explain those patterns, too. So we're still working to get sequence data off of these. I use generalized additive modeling techniques to investigate seasonal trends in population level seroprevalence, since we've been talking about the importance of seasonality in the system. So this is seroprevalence, the proportion of individuals who uh, demonstrate an antibody response to Nipah virus antigen in the idle and health and fats. The top panel shows data from Institute Pasteur, Madagascar, that was co collected um, historically <coughs> from July 2005 to 2000, January 2008, so before I worked in Madagascar. And this was just a traditional ELISA test, so I was given access to the positive-negative data, um, but not the raw samples. These are from uh, our own field studies from July of 2013 to January of 2016, essentially sa sampling these colonies uh, longitudinally. Um, so we used GAM techniques, random effects uh, on the site of sampling, because we sampled in multiple locations. And then I've overlain on these plots the yellow panels, which is the gestation period for the bat host in question, and uh, the gray panels are the dry season, so the fruit uh, scarce season in that system. So this is, uh, again, Nipah virus in the Eidolon duprinum, and then this is Ebola virus in Teropus rufus and Rosetta's Madagascariensis. And we see the same patterns with lower seroprevalence recaptured in the other species antigen combinations we assayed. So field data are often messy, but essentially we're seeing that the seroprevalence um, appears to cycle biannually. Um, the signal is the strongest actually in this historical data set where we see a peak uh, during the wet season and then a second peak at the gestation lactation transition for each species. We wanted to look at these seasonal patterns further, um, especially since reproduction seems to be important. We separated the data by sex, uh, and then used um, day of year as a predictor for zero status in male and female bats separately. Um, so we show here just the data for female bats. Um, these two panels are something different, so look at these for now. Um, the male uh, males do not demonstrate significant uh, zero significant seasonality and zero status in this system with our current data. Um, so again, we have the Eidolon duprianum, Teropus rufus, and Rosetta's madagascariensis. This is um, a seasonal signature across all of the antigens tested, um, using that antigen type as a fixed effect. And we essentially see that females have a significantly higher probability of testing seropositive during these gestation periods. And we can actually pick out the stagger, so the birth pulse happens in, uh, in sequence in, across these three different species. First in Teropus rufus, followed by Eidolon duprianum, and lastly, by Rosettus madagascariensis. Um, these two panels here, um, um, so this is a binomial GAM, um, looking at uh, 0, 1, whether you're zero negative or zero positive. And this is a Gaussian GAM, looking at the mass to forearm uh, ratio for an individual, again, uh, across uh, day of year as the annual predictor. So it's essentially a body mass index <coughs> for the bat. Uh, numbers above zero tell you when an animal is heavier than you would expect, uh, and numbers <coughs> below when it's thinner than you would expect. So we can see um, for males um, a significant seasonal trend in the body, ma body mass per forearm that declines across the dry season. So when animals have less access to fruit, they lose weight. Uh, and in females, we see that these patterns are basically swamped completely by the reproductive season. So these are all adult uh, individuals, and they're not corrected for pregnancy. And so 96% of breeding age Females in these populations give birth to one pup annually, so this is almost necessarily the growth of a fetus within uh, a female bat across the gestation period. 
So all this is to say that um, males seem to respond more to nutrient availability, whereas uh, females seem to be physiologically completely, um, completely influenced by the reproductive calendar. That seems to have a stronger effect on immunity because we don't see um, any significant effect of seasonality in the immune signature for the males. However, we have some anecdotal evidence to suggest that there might also be a subtle effect of nutritional availability on immunity in males too. We recaptured 17 Eidolon duprenum across this time series. Um, so each of these segments is an individual, and the two dots on either end represent its serotiter, its log MFI value at the point of sampling. Um, so these three dotted lines are the cutoffs for what constitutes a seronegative or a seropositive individual. Um, and so for males, we see that serotiter tends to increase across the uh, wet season, the fruit abundance season, and decrease across the dry season. For females, we see the opposite pattern, that it's dominated by reproduction. In particular, this one female was first caught seropositive when she was lactating, and she had weaned her pup by the time of second capture uh, and become seronegative. <coughs> So these statistical seasonal trends are interesting, um, but we wanted to try and get at some more mechanistic hypotheses of what was driving these trends. So we used uh, compartmental epidemiological modeling techniques to uh, look at the um, look at the mechanistic underpinnings of age zero prevalence patterns in our data. So some of you might be familiar with the susceptible infectious recovered model, um, traditionally used in um, epidemiological dynamics and in public health, um, first developed by Kermack and McKendrick in 1927. Essentially, we class hosts into three different compartments, susceptible, infectious, and recovered, uh, and use um, differential equations or sometimes discrete time equations to track their movements between those three classes. And we can fit these um, time series, these models, to data uh, to try and estimate the terms of transmission and possibly recovery if that's not known from the pathogen itself. Usually, um, we're taking a, case, a, a time series of case counts So, for <coughs> instance, children um, reporting to hospitals with measles. Um, so we would run this model out to um, equilibrium and fit the infectio infectious component to our time series of case counts. But in the case of wildlife disease, these animals are not presenting to the hospital as Ebola infectious. Um, so we have to rely more often on um, a signature of past exposure, so this antibody signature. So uh, our seropositive individuals um, we're classing as recovered in this system. Uh, and because it's still difficult to get time series out of wildlife data, we can use age sometimes as a proxy. So um, we can track. Uh, individual age classes within each component using matrix modeling techniques can be done in continuous time too, but we chose to do it in discrete time. Essentially where we know how many individuals between ages 0 and 1 are susceptible, between ages 1 and 2, 2 and 3, up to the full age distribution of the individual. Um, and then we can look at what the, um, what the age distribution of seropositive individuals is at the equilibrium um, of that model run to have better insight. To do this, we need age data from these animals, which in itself is not always straightforward. Um, but in the case of fruit bats, we can age them by uh, taking extractions of their teeth. So we take um, the lower left premolar tooth from Yaddle and Duprunum and Teropus rufus under anesthesia in the field. Um, and I should say that none of these animals were legally sampled. They were all released post um, sampling. Um, so this actually is an individual that I caught um, just last month. It, uh, it was the third time of its capture. We first caught him in October of 2014. He was sampled then. His tooth was extracted in December of 2014. And then in February of 2018, we caught him a third time, and his uh, lower left premolar gum is nicely healed over, and he's still doing well. So these bats put down layers of cementin uh, tissue annually in their teeth, so we can cut the teeth in cross-section and stain it, and then actually count the layers like a tree ring. <laughs> so this is a 14-year-old Eduprianum bat and a 2-year-old Teropus rufus bat, and we can construct age frequency distributions from these data. So this is the age frequency distribution for Eidol and Duprianum and for Teropus rufus. You can see that it's shorter, even though this is a larger-lived species, and if you fit an exponential model, that's this red line, to these data, 
you can infer the annual survival rate, which is 0.791 for Egyprianum and 0.566 for Tropus rufus, <laughs> much lower. Um, we think that this is a hunting effect, that they're shorter lived, um, and probably is something that uh, has been changing with time. We can also use these data to build these age zero prevalence curves when we pair it with our Luminex data. And so from here on out, I'm going to be talking about Nipah virus zero prevalence in Eidol and Duprinum, though these data are essentially matched um, in the case of Ebola zero prevalence in Tropus rufus. So here we have age on the x-axis, 0 to 15, um, and zero prevalence, um, 0 to 50% on the y-axis. So we see very high seroprevalence in neonates, then it declines. This is evidence of inherited maternal immunity, which is known in other bat systems. So lactating females can pass on antibodies through their milk to their pups, thereby protecting them for the first few months of life. Um, then we have low seroprevalence in those few early years, um, that, and then increasing seroprevalence with exposure across the first couple of years of life. And then we get this declining seroprevalence at late age. So we wanted to understand mechanistically what's driving these patterns. I mentioned that we sampled these animals longitudinally across 19 months, so we have some insight into the age seroprevalence distribution over time as well. So these are the same data but broken up by month of the year. Um, so again, NEPA seroprevalence in Eidol and Duprinum. These bats give birth uh, at the beginning of November. So we can see that there is a signature of this um, maternally immune class in those early months of life, and then it kind of disappears as that immunity wanes across the year. I've highlighted in red those panels that come from the same site. So we did sample at multiple sites that have distinct, uh, distinct seasonality because they're latitudinally different. And so in fitting these models, we opted just to fit to one site um, because we felt confident that we could actually match the seasonal trends um, within that site. So the way we would fit a model like this is we'd run it out to equilibrium, we'd take the uh, last year of that model, and then um, within each of these infection classes, we're also tracking the age distribution, and we'd say given that bi week um, or that week of the year, um, and that individual's age, how likely are our data given our model's guess of the age zero prevalence? So again, looking just at the recovered class um, for that particular time point. <coughs> I presented multiple examples of this SIR model, but we can obviously look at much more complex dynamics if we choose. Um, in all cases, um, we chose to include a maternally immune class because we had strong data suggesting that this was the case and we explored several dis different mechanistic hypotheses for what could be driving this trend. So first, just a MSIR model, um, whereby we fit the terms for waning immunity and transmission. We fixed the recovery rate at two weeks, which, um, based on experimental infection data, um, seems to be consistent, both for henopoviruses and filoviruses. We also considered uh, a model form whereby individuals could seroconvert directly into the R class without becoming infectious. Uh, and transmissible to other individuals in between. And we did this because we know that these dead-end seroconversion events seem to be important in this system. We also looked uh, at a model form that allowed for waning antibody-mediated immunity, whereby recovered individuals could then return to the susceptible class and then fit this term for waning immunity. We also looked at a model form um, that included a same term for waning immunity, but individuals moved into a class called that we decided to term N, which essentially meant that they were immune, but that they were seronegative. So if you remember at the beginning of the talk, we talked about how bats um, exhibited this anti uh, innate uh, constitutively expressed interferon. So there are other mechanisms by which they can um, be immune to reinfection. Um, also cell-mediated mechanisms. So here we're assuming that post antibody response, individuals can decline in serotiter um, and be seronegative, but not contribute to new infection events. And then a model form that's essentially an extension of that, whereby this uh, antibody-mediated immunity can be primed based on contact with other infectious individuals. Um, so we ran all of these models, um, fit them to this subset of um, seasonal age seroprevalence data. Um, so here we have uh, the model fit over the data, um, and then these panels on the right are the corresponding AIC values, or delta AIC, 0 to 5, um, for the model fits to these data. So essentially, 
um, our data are not strong enough to differentiate hugely among many of these um, different predictors, but um, MSIRN is, uh, is the best fit. Um, I should say we explored two different variations on this model whereby N-class individuals, so those which are seronegative but still immune, can either give birth to pups that are maternally immune, that are antibody positive, or pups that are susceptible. And we did this because we don't actually have um, lactating females in our age seroprevalence distribution. So we have no reproductive females in this data set because it seemed unethical to take teeth from lactating females that are already so physiologically stressed. Um, so this is sort of a proxy to allow us to say that um, late age individuals in N class might actually be seropositive and able to produce a seropositive pup. Um, so that seems to be our best fit, but essentially we can't differentiate from an MISRS hypothesis. Um, and basically the big difference between these two hypotheses both incorporate this assumption of waning immunity, which seems to be important. Um, but one allows individuals to be reinfected and one allows them, um, forbids them from doing that. Um, so we get a plateau at late age classes in seroprevalence in an MSIRS case and a decline in an MSIRN case. Um, and our inability to distinguish is essentially because um, the size of the sample <coughs> is correlated to the um, sampling size, so we just have very few late age individuals. So we're working to improve those uh, inferences as well as our longitudinal inference. Mm -hmm. So um, this is showing, um, this is the population level data and this is um, taken by bi-week, the fit of the year. So again, the fit um, by bi-week is not great, but we also have very little information about what's going on in these late age individuals and very few individuals in some of these cases. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is that uh, in the case of this MSIRN hypothesis, whereby um, uh, seronegative immune individuals can still give birth to uh, humorally immune pups, we see this signature in the early weeks, both in the model and the data, of, um, of this peak in neonates that are antibody positive, and then it disappears across the, the year uh, as they lose that immunity. Also, our parameter estimates are very encouraging. Um, we estimate, um, in fitting this model to these data, uh, maternal immunity at a period of four months, which is consistent with the literature, and humoral immunity um, around five and a quarter years. And a paper um, by my colleague, Allison Peel, uh, just came out a couple of weeks ago looking at age seroprevalence trends in Hendra virus in Australian flying foxes, and they get very, very similar results. But we're trying to improve our inference. Um, so I just got back from two months in Madagascar uh, in collaboration with Institute Pasteur. We have a capacity building uh, NIH grant where we are monthly sampling these populations, collecting additional serological and also concurrent PCR viral shedding data um, to try and understand age seroprevalence and age prevalence across a season. Um, we'll also be extending our uh, insight into within host immune signatures, chiefly using RNA-seq techniques, um, because uh, my, one of my committee members from Princeton, Jessica Metcalf, among others, has developed some techniques to um, use regression techniques to understand how we might take um, a, a within host signature of something like serotiter or gene expression profile and better understand heterogeneity within these disease classes. So at present, our models assume that all individuals who are susceptible are equally susceptible. All individuals who are infectious are equally likely to transmit. But especially in the case of serotiter, you can imagine that an individual that has a lower serotiter might be more likely to um, wane in immunity than an individual that has a high serotiter and was recently infected. So we're hoping to be able to use some of these within host trends to better, uh, <coughs> better highlight our, um, our epidemiological influence. So in the last few minutes of the talk, I'm going to touch on um, some of these within-host processes of pathogen control. This is work that is still ongoing, um, but is, is in collaboration with Kartik Chandra and Melinda Eng, both at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Hopefully, I've convinced you at this point that female bats have dynamic antibody titers. <coughs> we see the signature of heightened seroprevalence and heightened serotiter in reproductive females both in the literature and in my own data. 
but we ask how do bats control infections during the rest of the year? I previously mentioned that we know that at least a couple frugivorous bat species have constitutively expressed interferon, suggesting another mechanism by which they might be able to control these infections. And we wanted to use uh, compartmental modeling techniques to see what the impact of this might be on viral spread using tissue culture data. So we ran a series of what are known as plaque assays, where essentially you grow a monolayer of cells in culture, um, infect them with vi virus, and put an agar overlay that restricts transmission neighbor to neighbor. Um, we looked at two cell lines, um, Vero cells, which are deficient in their interferon response. It's a green monkey cell line that's used commonly in molecular biology. And Tropus electo cells, which are one of the species that have been described as constitutively expressing interferon. We looked at three viruses, vesicular stomatis virus, which is a rhabdovirus, a multi-species infecting pig virus, and two recombinant forms that incorporated the Ebola and Marburg glycoprotein. And so the reason we chose to do this is um, essentially cell entry is mediated by these bat-derived filoviruses in this case. And previous work out of the Chandran lab demonstrated that Eidolon helvum has a polymorphism in the filovirus receptor that makes it refractory to infection with Ebola. Tropus electo has a polymorphism in that same receptor, making it refractory to infection with Marburg. And so we were interested in being able to differentiate the contributions of immune response versus a cell entry um, uh, defense mechanism uh, to these pathogen dynamics. This was based on previous work <coughs> um, conducted by Tom Howitt and Brian Grenfell at Cambridge uh, in the early 2000s. They explored the effect of interferon, so again this antiviral cytokine, on the spread of herpes virus in bovine kidney cells. Essentially they took pictures of the spread of plaque, so the spread of dead cells in uh, tissue culture, and fit a susceptible infectious dead model to these data, assuming that infectious cells were secreting interferon and thereby able to enable their neighboring cells to go into an antiviral state. And because plaque assays incorporate this auger overlay that actually restricts transmission neighbor to neighbor, they built a spatially explicit model whereby um, these blue cells are antiviral, these green are susceptible, and these gray are dead. They were able to say that an infectious cell is releasing interferon, a neighboring cell explicitly goes into this antiviral state and can stop the spread of infection. So they fit to this purple curve, the dead curve. Uh, we used the tools of modern molecular biology to fit to the infected's curve. Um, we can do that because uh, our viruses were recombinant and incorporated green fluorescent protein. So we can actually take a picture of infectious cells using a fluorescent microscope. Um, so that's VSV, VSV Ebola, and VSV Marburg. Um, so these are what our photos looked like. Um, we can process those images. Uh, so white here are infectious cells, and black are any state variable that is not infectious and construct a time series. So here we do have measles case counts over time, except this is the proportion of infected cells and hours post-infection. So open circles are actual raw data. We ran a bunch of trials for each virus cell type combination and used, again, GAM models to um, basically create a statistical average of the proportion uh, infectious per, per unit time. And then we fit a mechanistic model to those um, to those statistical averages. So our model this time incorporates an exposed class by which um, cells uh, are infected with virus but are not yet infectious to uh, neighboring cells, and importantly, in the case of our data, not yet, uh, not yet expressing green fluorescent protein. And in this case, we tracked uh, interferon globally within our model. And so in the case of a constitutively expressing cell, we assume that any cells that are susceptible or exposed will be secreting interferon and that this will ramp up across the time course um, of the assay. Um, those that are infectious and dead are, are not secreting that. And then obviously virus cells that are interferon deficient don't incorporate this. And then we can use the same techniques whereby we fit these models to our data and we optimize those parameters that are not known from the literature. So in this case, transmission and virulence, the rate of death of infectious cells. So we are able to recapture these data using this simple mean field model, um, whereby we, we aren't incorporating any spatial dynamics. We're assuming that cells are, um, are contacting one another homogeneously. 
Um, but we have to make a time-dependent beta term and a time-dependent alpha term, um, uh, essentially, uh, that are both dependent on this interferon quantity. So essentially what we're saying is that as interferon ramps up in the system, both transmission and virulence um, are, are curbed. So promoting simultaneously resistance and tolerance. And so what that looks like um, is in our Vero cell data, essentially we get um, total monolayer destruction, <coughs> depletion of susceptible cells in all time series. So the virus runs through the, runs through the monolayer, kills all the cells, and the time series ends because there's no longer susceptibles available. Um, the same thing happens in BSV wild type form when infecting a bat cell, this terrific selective cell line. But in the case of Ebola and Marburg, they incorporate that um, cell, entry, uh, cell entry mechanism that limits viral spread. We're actually able to kick the virus out, and at the end of the, of the time series, the cell line wins. We have susceptible cells um, that have taken over, and the virus is, is not maintained in the system. But to recapture these with a simple model, we do need to make this um, pretty strong biological argument that interferon is affecting both of these terms. Um, so here, um, this mean field approximation does shed light on the strategies by which viruses can overcome bat defenses. <coughs> so I said that uh, VSV in its wild type form is able to win to destroy the monolayer in the case of trophic selective cells. Um, and the way that it does this is essentially by rapid susceptible cell depletion. So if you remember, this model actually tracks global concentration of interferon. Um, so the number of susceptible and exposed cells in the assay um, contributes to this increasing rate of, um, of, of, uh, of cell resistance to this pathogen. Um, so if the virus is able to kill those cells, it actually is also affecting the, um, the counter, uh, counter effect of the, of the cell line against the virus. Um, in the case where the cell wins, it's able to maintain enough susceptible cells that it can uh, force the virus uh, out before, before those are, are uh, depleted. And so what I've plotted here is this is the effective reproduction number, which is essentially um, a measure of, of growth of the epidemic. Um, so this is the uh, basic reproduction number for the pathogen multiplied by the susceptible population. And so when it's above this red line one, the epidemic is increasing, and then when it's below this red line, the epidemic is decreasing. So this point where it crosses is the peak in each of these time series. Um, and so you'll see that our effective, this black dotted line, is forced below one um, in the cases where the virus wins, but in the case where the cell wins, uh, our effective is forced below one while we still have susceptible cells in the population. And essentially what this means is typically we think of a transmission virulence trade-off as a virus uh, transmits faster, increases its replication rate, it incurs some sort of mor uh, mortality cost, um, it's replicating faster, the cell is dying faster, and we often think that there should be some sort of upper end um, evolutionary check on the amount at which, uh, at which it can increase this replication rate. And in the case, at least, of Marburg virus, um, whereby cell uh, transmission rate is, is held back, and we have this constitutively expressing interferon, um, when we plot these two against each other, we see that increases in viral propagation are not matched by increases in viral mortality, um, which should suggest that we would favor selection of highly virulent pathogens. Um, so we're still working out some of the biological implications of that, um, and hoping to also address this um, <coughs> with a spatial model, because sometimes we can get some of these effects due to space alone and not need to make some of these um, larger assumptions. And so essentially, we've built a fully uh, spatially structured model that tracks um, the spread of virus um, across all one million cells in culture. So here, uh, in the case of no interferon response, we see that virus spreads across the monolayer, susceptible cells are depleted, and we end up with the monolayer completely dead. Um, in the case of a constitutively interferon expressing cell type, um, we see as uh, each of these cells become exposed, interferon is building up in the system and cells go into this antiviral state um, whereby transmission is restricted. So down here in the time series, we see something similar to what we saw in the case of that Marburg virus in the Tropis elective cell line, where infection starts to take off, gets blocked, and then eventually dies off, and we have live cells at the end of the time series. 
Um, so this is still a work in progress, um, and we're hoping to wrap it up in the next couple of months. So with that, um, I'd like to say thank you to my collaborators, both in Madagascar in the field, um, Institute past chair, um, Christian and Jean-Michel Ayreau, um, uh, Lin Fa Wong at Duke National University of Singapore, and then also um, <coughs> Melinda and Kartik at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, my doctoral dissertation committee, Andy Dobson, Andrea Graham, Brian Grenfell, and Jessica Metcalf, and then my two hosts at Berkeley, Mike Boots and Bert Kronz. Happy to take any questions. Somebody can put the lights there. We have time for questions. Actually, it's just that unexposed individuals. Is it possible that they've just those are the ones that live? That they lived. Um, so it looks a lot like an infection-induced mortality model. Um, so if you look at age seroprevalence for HIV, for instance, um, only those individuals who those individuals who are alive at late age classes are are so because they never became infected. Um, so. Originally, um, we did fit several models incorporating assumptions of infection-induced mortality. Um, reviewers didn't like it very much, um, mostly because there's been no evidence to, to suggest that in the literature so far. Um, I think that there's, it's highly probable that there is some sort of fitness effect of maintaining Ebola intracellularly across a long lifespan. Um, I think with longer term um, data sets, we might be able to actually pick up that signature, but I think that it, it's going to be a while before we can actually say that. So right now, we can't really justify it um, statistically because it just adds a, another parameter. Um, so the simpler explanation would be um, would be some of these other mechanisms. But it's totally possible you get the same effect. Yeah. Um, it seems that the interferon is working actually better in bats than it does in other in other systems. Is that first? Is that True, or and is there something specifically different about the interferon in bats? Yeah, so I don't think it's interferon better as in stronger. I think it's more the time. So it's constitutively expressed. So basically, they're primed. There's no lag time in this induced response, um, and so basically the whole tissue culture is antiviral from the beginning, and infection doesn't have time to really take off. And so that's what we see vesicular stomatis virus does really well in wild type, is that it's able to kill off enough of those cells rapidly that it can get sort of ahead of that host response. Um, so I think early in infection is very important for what the, what the time course and pathogenesis of, of that epidemic is going to be. And I think we see that too with a lot of what's coming out in the literature about bats. Um, that they have dampened immune responses in terms of induced immune responses, dampened sting pathways, they lack this pH um, YIN family, but that they have this sort of generalist immune response that seems to be enough to keep things slow at the beginning. You, you started off by saying that bats don't, um, don't seem to show symptoms when they become infected as much, but aren't there viruses where uh, that do reduce fitness, and I mean, what happens with rabies in, in bats? For yeah, example? so rabies is one of the few examples. Um, in fact, the there's it's it's really the only convincing example of um, having a mortality effect, a subtle mortality effect on certain populations of bats. Um, rabies has an interesting pathogenesis, right? It goes dormant sometimes, and um, we don't really know how to model it particularly well. There's a couple examples of extracellular infections. Bats are um, quite, uh, quite susceptible to um, uh, Bordadella. Um, and then there's been a couple cases of experimental infection trials where they just give it a really high MOI, um, very high dose. Um, and they, they can seem to cause mortality that way. So, um, so I think with rabies, um, 
it attacks the central nervous system and, and bats are susceptible to immunopathology if it's sort of timed correctly. Uh, and I think it just uh, hits a, a really vulnerable point with the brainstem. But they do, um, they do tolerate rabies much better than most, um, most mammals. Yeah, so my, my wife did some work with bat rabies, and one of the things that was interesting that in her research was that down and dying bats under bridges, like with free tail, Mexican free tail bats, had very high rabies prevalence, like 70% of them were rabies positive, but healthy bats in the colony were had very low prevalence for rabies. And I wonder if the scenario that you've described for how the immune system works and when they're sort of, you know, how they might be modulating it depending on what their energetic needs are, if that has if there's any relationship there between this kind of thing where the bats, when they're healthy, have the immune response or whatever they need to be doing to prevent the, the rabies viruses from impacting them, but then if they get sick or something else happens, then suddenly they become susceptible to it. Yeah. That fits and your model. Yeah, I think that fits, and I also think that, um, so one mechanism that I didn't really touch on, again, because it's more complex, but there are hypotheses that these, um, in some cases, are sort of persistent latent infections. We haven't done a very good job empirically of of collecting evidence for that, um, but you can imagine that if there was a persistent infection that these otherwise stressed individuals might be assaying positive for rabies, whereas ones that, um, that were infected but were healthy otherwise, you might not pick up the virus. Um, so, yeah. What are the human implications in Madagascar where the particularly larger bats are widely eaten? Yeah. Are there studies on, I mean, clearly, yeah. Most of the bats they're eating are infected based on your research. Yeah, very, very good question. Um, so there was one serological study in the late 80s uh, looking at hemorrhagic fever seroprevalence. Um, people are seropositive to Ebola in the system and not Marburg, which is consistent. consistent. Um, we tested Ebola um, and Marburg antigens and had no Marburg seropositive bats. Um, there were also some other, uh, like they didn't find any arena viruses in the human, uh, arena seropositivity in the human population, and Madagascar lacks all of the rodent reservoirs for arena viruses. So, so there are some suggestions that that might be believable. I actually, so I just got back from Madagascar, and we just uh, sent 2,000 human serum samples from all across Madagascar to Lin Pa Wong. Um, so we're going to be assaying for all of these same uh, bat viruses. I think it's highly likely there will be people who are seropositive to um, probably to all of these bat antigens, though inferring what that tells us about um, actual transmission versus just uh, dead-end seroconversion is, is a little bit tricky. Um, there haven't been any documented human outbreaks, um, but virus, viral fever incidents that go unexplained are quite common in Madagascar, so that is not to say that um, it hasn't happened. In bats that hibernate, do they does their immune system also decrease when they're dormant, or do they become more susceptible to immune? Yeah, um, so they, they basically shut down metabolic functioning, and what you usually see, so in the case of viral infections, viruses usually can't tolerate the temperatures at hibernation very well either, so that doesn't seem to be a problem, but fungal infections and some bacterial infections actually replicate much better at lower temperatures. So that's been the issue with white nose syndrome, is that uh, the fungus actually preferentially grows at temperatures in which these bats hibernate. And so basically what happens is the bat uh, is, is dormant um, and the fungus is just growing, and then it's when the bat wakes up and tries to then clear that infection that it causes problems. So it's actually the immunopathology that's killing them in the case of white nose syndrome. Um, and they found that uh, these infected bats are um, undergoing more frequent arousals and, and just trying to cope with it, but don't really understand how to do so. So similar to um, um, this sort of early on viral load that matters in tissue culture, we see that this initial load um, matters for the immune response too. Yeah, so you mentioned at the beginning that one of the things that's peculiar about bats relative to other mammals is that they're volant, but it seems like another thing that might be also relevant is that so many of the species are highly colonial, mm -hmm. and I'm just curious if that also might be related to their unusual um, you know, immune response and whether or not these sorts of fine-scale demographic analyses are being undertaken for a colonial versus 
more solitary species? Yeah, so definitely important, highly gregarious, live up to populations of a thousand, of millions of individuals in some cases. Um, so we haven't done any sort of tracking so far. Um, we have some proposals in to add it to our Madagascar system. Um, I definitely think it's important. Yadalon helvum has been shown to be panmictic across all of Africa. Um, so a huge range that's interconnected. Um, you would think that it would, um, it would mean there's a high probability of infection in these individuals. Um, so um, evolving um, evolutionary selection for some sort of tolerance mechanism. It seems like they're likely to get infected, so probably not worth it to resist it. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about population size is thinking about critical community size and how these populations can maintain a virus. And at least in Madagascar, um, we have fewer bats than we would expect to maintain a, uh, be able to maintain something like a paramyxovirus, like we would think it would spread through the population um, too quickly, um, with an annual birth pulse to actually be uh, endemic in that, in that population. Um, and so that sort of increases support for some of these persistent infection hypotheses, um, ways that these bats might, or latent hypotheses. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Carol once again. <clears throat>